I was born in 1937. As a boy, I became very interested in astronomy. For this reason, I decided to study mathematics at Cambridge, after which I commenced a PhD in astrophysics in Munich. However, at this time, I became deeply interested in foundational issues in physics, above all, the nature of time. I came to the conclusion that time itself does not exist. The last book is called The End of Time. What is it about? It's explaining my idea that time is really an illusion, and motion too, that they are not really there in the, in the external world. They are put into the world by us in the way we interpret it, and, and by our brains too. So it's not a linear story? It's not a linear story. Uh, it appears linear to us, but I think this is an artifact of, of the way nature works, that it, it creates this impression in us that there is a linear time. But if we could really see the, the totality of everything, we would see that there's nothing linear about it at all. The main idea that I have is, is the idea of a now. If you could freeze the camera now and just show me as I am and, and all the atoms in my body and everything else, the, the whole of, of Holland, the whole universe, completely frozen like a snapshot, that would be what I call a now. I mean, with the camera looking at me, I don't seem to change very much except by moving my hands around. But if you could look microscopically at my hands and look at my hemoglobin molecules with a real microscope, you would not recognize me from one second to another. In my body, every second, 100 million, million, million of these hemoglobin molecules, which are very, very complicated structures. That number is destroyed and the same number is created. So in a way you should think of each, at each split second, I'm really a very different person. If you want the, the scientific notion of time, the time that, that Christian Huygens first measured accurately with his pendulum clock, that is actually an interesting subject because very little theoretical work has been done on establishing exactly what is that time that is being measured by a pendulum clock or by my wristwatch or an atomic clock. And in fact, I think that the work that I did with my Italian collaborator Bruno Bertotti has shown that really the time that is measured by clocks is in some real sense an average of all the changes in the universe. That if you imagine two nows, they will not be quite the same. There will be some difference between them. And if you work out some weighted average of all of that difference between those two nows, you can call that in some sense the amount of time between them. So this is, this is nothing to do with some substance there, it's just difference between those two things. And I think this is the quantity that is actually being measured by my watch now. So time exists? No, because if you give me two snapshots of nows, one has a certain structure, the other has a certain structure. And from that, just using those, I can tell you how much 
time there is. But we don't have to call it that amount of time. Nothing is changed in those two snapshots by saying they're half an hour apart. But th so, so in that sense, it's all derived from, from the two snapshots. Now, this is very different from the Newtonian picture, where Newton presupposes there's a river of time flowing that is there before anything is put into it. And what I'm saying is that the things are there first, and the time is deduced from it afterwards. How long does it now last? It has no duration. In, in, in the standard way of thinking, it's absolutely instantaneous. There is no thickness to it. Nothing changes. Now, if nothing changes, you cannot say that time has passed. So these instants, in one sense, are truly eternal because they never change. And on the other hand, because nothing changes, they are experienced as a flash. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice contradiction, really. Mm -hmm. it, the eternal is experienced as a, as a flash because nothing changes. How should I picture these nows? Is it, is it, are they juxtaposed? And what is in between them? There is nothing in between them. It, it, it's just, let, let me take, the, each of these are, are, separate, are separate snapshots. They're, they're, they're each separate pictures. Look at them. And there's no, there's no difference. These things are not changed by me reversing the order in which I put them. It may be convenient for the way we think about the world and for ordering our experiences to suppose that these come in a certain order. But in fact, the picture is not changed whether I put it there, whether I put that one first, or, 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 or it should be around that way, shouldn't it? Uh, it doesn't make any difference to the picture itself. The snapshot is completely self-contained, and what we call yesterday is self-contained and has its experience of being yesterday, and, and today has memories of yesterday, and therefore I, I say that it's later than what we call yesterday, but each is actually completely self-contained, and there's no reason why you should put one snapshot here and another one there and another one there. Back in 1687, Isaac Newton published his famous Principia, his laws of motion and everything. And here in Holland was Christian Huygens, the greatest scientist of his age until Newton appeared on the scene. And Huygens must, in, probably in this very room, have sat and read Newton's Principia. And he recognized Newton was a great genius, but he says, there must be something wrong with this. There's something not quite right. And what was wrong was that Newton described the whole universe as if it existed in an invisible framework. There was an invisible framework of absolute space, actually just like this room, as if it was filled with glass, but you couldn't see any of the room. That was the invisible framework in, things, in which things moved. And there was a time, said Newton, which flowed like an invisible river, uniformly without reference to anything else. And Huygens thought about this, and he thought, that can't be right. Because really, all we see is other things. We see things in the room, chairs, outside. We see people walking around in the park. And really, the only things that can count are the relative things, how one thing is placed relative to another. And he thought about this, and he said, it must be wrong. And he wrote some famous letters to his colleague Leibniz in Germany, and they agreed with each other that Mr. Newton cannot be right, that's something wrong there. And it was only much later in the, in the late 19th century when Ernst Mach, the man who made his, became famous for doing his work on the Mach numbers, he was a great philosopher of science. He said, it, it is utterly beyond our powers to measure the changes of things by time. Much rather, time is an abstraction at which we arrive from the changes of things. Like many other theoretical physicists today, one is trying to find a, 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 a description of the entire universe which unites two theories. There's Einstein's 
theory of relativity and gravitation, which describes the universe as a whole, galaxies and, and stars and even ourselves. And that works wonderfully. And then there's quantum mechanics, which at the moment only describes atomic systems, molecules and so forth, the very small. And that was discovered uh, a little bit later in 1925, 10 years after Einstein's theory. And, and these two theories are, are very different. And everybody who has thought about this is, is convinced that quantum mechanics must be the more fundamental theory, must be the deeper theory. And in some senses, it must it, it ought to apply to the whole universe, at least that's what most people think. And somehow Einstein's theory must be made to match that. Now, 40 years ago, people started really very seriously trying to combine these two theories. And one of the central problems they came up against is the, is the way time is treated in the two theories. In Einstein's theory of relativity, time is extremely flexible. It seems to be there, but it's very hard to get your hands on it. On the other hand, the, the, the time that is used in quantum mechanics is, is just like the old-fashioned time of, of Isaac Newton, just sort of tick, tick, tick going on, uh, completely independent of the whole world. And, and 32 years ago, at last an equation was found, which is called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, and this is meant to be the equation which describes the whole universe, and lo and behold, there is no trace of time in it. It describes a world which is completely static. You cannot, it, it, time disappears from that equation. And, and there's been a lot of argument about can that be right, and, 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 and is it right, and so forth. Now, I think it is. And I think the, the interesting thing is that you have these two theories, quantum mechanics and general relativity, with very different notions of time. And the only way, I think, in which you can unite them is by saying there is no time at all. Each has got their separate notion of time. So the only way you can marry the two is say there is no time at all. Physicists always have to have very simple models to try and explain the world. Suppose we had just a universe which was made of just only three particles, just three particles. Now, if that was the case, then they would always form some triangle. And, and this can be represented by this. This, this triangle could say there's, there's one particle here, one atom here, one atom there, and one atom there. And that would be like my snapshot of an instant of the universe formed by those three particles. And then you see, there's another one. So, possible instance of time. Now, what I want to do is show you how you can put them together in a schematic way and represent all possible instants of time. And then I will truly show you what eternity looks like. Because in a way, eternity must be all of the instants of time that can be. These three axes are the sides of my triangle. So this axis is going to measure the length between particle one and particle two. So this one along here is going to be the distance between two and three. And this is going to be the distance between particle one and three. So I'm going to have, I'm going to represent this triangle by a point with respect to these axes. And now I'm going to show you what the totality of all of them looks like. That's my land of nows, or Platonia as I call it. Now, now, what is this here? Now, this is, this is an, an equilateral triangle. So the equilateral triangles all lie on the line that goes from this point down here and runs up the middle of the model out towards there. And this, this has a side of about this length, so this triangle is represented by a point about there. So that's, and here's that's another a, equilateral triangle, which is a bit bigger, so that's a point a bit further out there. And these ones, this triangle is somewhere up here. Now, and, and this is a model of, if you like, it's a model of all the states of the, of the three-body universe. It comes to an end here at a point that I call alpha because it is so very special. And it has these frontiers, 
But in the other direction, it opens out to infinity. These axes actually go all the way out to infinity. The point I'm trying to make with, with this is that it leads us to a completely different way of thinking about time. Now, the way people normally think about time is that it's like a line. It is. It could either be a river, but a washing line is a very good thing. And this is the past, and this is the future. And each of the bits of washing there are the individual instants of time. And this is linear time. And the deepest notion almost everybody, including scientists, have of time is that it's like a river, like a line, like that. And now we can look at my alternative model. And you see, this is a completely different structure. First of all, it's not linear. Remember, each point in here represents a now, a special configuration of the universe. So I can hook this here. This could be a history of the universe, because each point along here represents one of my snapshots, a now. So this could be, even if you like, the Big Bang down there. And this could be us somewhere up here now. The washing line, the image of time, goes on to infinity in that direction and infinity in that direction, from eternity to eternity. But this model, if you look at eternity in this way, then you see that in some senses a Big Bang is inevitable, because this point alpha is always bound to be there. And, and also, it suggests why you can have a difference between a past and a future, because Eternity is completely different at one end from the opposite end. It comes to an end here. This is the end of everything here that can exist. If, if the world is really timeless in the sense that I think it is and the Wheeler-De Witt equation suggests, then, then there will be many instants. Each of them will be self-contained. Each of them will be like what we experience precisely now, but in, in very different ways. The universe you're proposing, is that a universe in which all the things are juxtaposed in a kind of simultaneous situation, is that...? Yes, quantum mechanics says that, in a sense, you have got to consider everything that could potentially exist. Everything that is logically possible has to be taken into account and actually influences everything else. The probabilities for everything are determined by everything. So not only are, is all of the past there at once and all of what we think of the future in, in the old linear time notion, not only is that present, but countless other possibilities are also there in, in an absolutely unendingly vast space of possibilities, all there at once. So are you here or aren't you here? This incarnation of me is certainly here, but also there is uh, an incarnation of me in which I was never asked to come to Holland to make this film, and I'm just sitting at home in Oxfordshire having my tea. <laughs> Are you saying that the way we conceive the world, psychologically, is uh, fundamentally different from the way the world is, physically? That seems to be very much the case. Quantum mechanics certainly suggests there is much more out there in the world than we conceive. And it, it, it may not be so impossible, because after all, before the Copernican Revolution, nobody was in any doubt that the, the Earth is at rest. And in fact, it, it, it seems to be absolutely obvious that the Earth is at rest. I mean, how can we be sitting here in this studio? And nobody could believe that the Earth is whizzing round and, and going round the sun. And yet, in the end, the great scientists like Galileo and Newton persuaded us otherwise. And, and maybe this process is going on. And it took 
over a hundred years for people really to accept Copernicus's proposal. Now the quantum mechanics is much more remarkable, so I think it could take centuries in normal parlance for people to come to grips with it and really feel comfortable with it. Here you see all, all of my two days in Holland, really. This is, is my universe in Holland. Lots and lots of nows, and they're all, they're all different and self-contained. They're all snapshots, and it doesn't really matter in, in which order you put them. This is the, one, the first one I took at Schiphol when I arrived. Here I am getting my bags put in the taxi there. Here I've arrived at the hotel and I'm, I'm signing on. Here's the, the dinner party on the first evening with the producer and the researcher. And next morning, here we are going to uh, Den Haag, to the home of, of Christian Huygens. And here's the camera team putting up their, uh, all their doing all their work. Here's me preparing my How can you live nowadays without the concept of time? Well, uh, I don't get rid of the concept of time because it, it's, it's, it's there in my being. I have that experience of it and in fact I'm a very punctual person and, and my children are always teasing me because I'm looking at my watch and saying, ah yes we must leave in four and a half minutes and things like this. So, so that's all right with me but what I also like to do is spend at least four or five hours of every day doing things where I'm just governed by the natural rhythms of hunger and the mo movement of the sun. I like to walk very much or listen to music, where I completely forget about the passage of time and just enjoy each present moment as they come, as they exist. There's only one way that this can end. I'm going to take a Polaroid of all the Polaroids, and that's going to be a snapshot of my universe in Holland. I came to the conclusion that each split second that time itself does not exist. 